Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley and & Sons, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Neuroinflammation Models, Use in Studies of Neurodegeneration and Regeneration. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and R&D Systems. As the flagship brand for Biotechni, R&D Systems' bioactive proteins, antibodies, and related tools have been trusted by the industry for nearly 30 years. Current Protocols is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 16,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your question will not be seen by any of the other attendees, so please don't be shy about asking them. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides and a customizable certificate of attendance. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Terry O'Banion is Professor and Interim Chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry in New York, and he has been involved in neuroinflammation research for over 20 years. Dr. O'Banion received his MD and PhD in microbiology from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and was then a postdoctoral fellow and instructor in the laboratory of Dr. Donald Young at the University of Rochester. During this time, Dr. O'Banion's work exploring the role of glucocorticoids in rapid modulation of transformed cell phenotype led to the identification and cloning of cyclooxygenase 2 and recognition of its importance in inflammation. In 1991, Dr. O'Banion was appointed assistant professor in neurology at the University of Rochester and initiated a series of studies examining the role of cyclooxygenase and neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's pathogenesis using cell culture models and human tissue. In addition to his work in Alzheimer's disease, Dr. O'Banion's lab pursues work in other neurodegenerative diseases and is investigating the role of neuroinflammation in hippocampal neurogenesis and injury following CNS radiation exposure. In addition to his research, Dr. O'Banion also oversees training of 65 MD-PhD students as the director of the University of Rochester's Medical Scientist Training Program. So let's begin with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. O'Banion. Thank you, Gwen, for that introduction, that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, share uh, information about uh, the potential use of models of neuroinflammation to study neurodegeneration and regeneration. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to define first what neuroinflammation is. And uh, for me, I think it's important to keep in mind that neuroinflammation is a local tissue reaction that's mediated by the endogenous brain cells. And these are principally the microglia and astrocytes of the brain. Neuroinflammation is a component of all CNS injuries and can be seen in, con in the context of degenerative disease, toxicant exposure, infection, trauma, or ischemia. It's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about neuroinflammation that the involvement of peripheral blood elements, things like neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, varies a lot with disease process. So, for example, in a disease like multiple sclerosis, there's a very prominent um, role for peripheral blood elements because it's a lymphocyte-driven pathology in the brain. Whereas in a disease like Alzheimer's disease, where a beta plaques elicit an inflammatory reaction, there's very, not very much evidence that uh, peripheral blood elements play a, a major role. In keeping in mind uh, our, our thinking about neuroinflammation, it's critical to keep in mind that uh, neuroinflammation is a wound repair response that has both potential beneficial and detrimental outcomes. As an example of neuroinflammation, I show here a slide of rapid microglial activation. Uh, these, uh, this picture uh, here is an illustration of microglia in the brain of a rat, and this is uh, stained with an antibody against the P2X7 receptor. 
Uh, and these microglia show a morphology that includes a cell soma and a series of fine processes. This is the normal resting microglial um, uh, picture. When these animals were exposed then to cayenic acid to induce a seizure and examined only two hours later, the microglia take on a very different phenotype. Their processes are thickened and retracted. Uh, they show this very dramatic change in morphology. And this is one hallmark of uh, neuroinflammation, in this case, a rapid activation of microglial cells. Um, but neuroinflammation can also occur on a very long-term basis. And so here's an example of work uh, in Alzheimer's disease. In this image uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we have microglia shown here with small fine processes as displayed by a lectin stain. And this particular sample is representative of um, a person who died at the age of about 80 years old uh, and was non-demented at the time of death and had no evidence for Alzheimer's disease. And in this illustration, you can see that the microglia show these small fine processes uh, within this brain. However, if you look at the brain from a comparable region, a part of the brain from a comparable region of a person who died at age 80 with Alzheimer's disease, you can see that the microglia take on this very dramatic change in morphology, we term microglial activation. And if you do double stains with antibodies that detect both microglia here in brown and A beta plaque shown here in black, you can see that the microglia tend to be associated with the plaques in the Alzheimer's brain. And this is one idea is that the nidus of inflammation uh, in Alzheimer's disease brain is in part caused by the presence of these A beta plaques. And to illustrate uh, uh, astrocyte activation, this is a similar slide down in the lower left-hand part of your uh, image of astrocyte immunoreactivity with an antibody against glial fibrillary acidic protein, which is a marker for activated astrocytes. And in the brain of an 80-year-old individual who died without dementia, there is some evidence of activation of these cells, which is apparent in older individuals. But in the Alzheimer's case, as shown here, there's large clumps of these activated astrocytes. And as illustrated here with a different stain, uh, GFAP is in red and in green is the stain for uh, fibrillar amyloid beta. The astrocytes, like the microglia, cluster around the A-beta plaques. And so this is an example of the chronic neuroinflammation seen in Alzheimer's disease and is used here as a representative of many other disease processes. There are many different ways to measure neuroinflammation, and I've listed only a few here. As I've shown you already, one can use immunohistochemical detection to look at alterations in glial cell morphology or glial cell expression of certain, uh, certain proteins, such as glial fibrillary acidic protein for astrocytes. One can quantify cytokines and chemokines associated with neuroinflammation, either by using ELISA or Westerns or uh, PCR, uh, quantitative PCR for measuring message levels. One can measure key inflammatory enzymes. I've included a few of these, NADPH oxidase, cyclooxygenase 2, and inducible nitric oxide synthase, or their products, for example, prostaglandins in tissues uh, from inflamed uh, brain. And finally, flow cytometry has been increasingly utilized to characterize cell components of the inflammatory reactions. And this has uh, made a, a large leaps in quantitation of these reactions at the cellular level. So our topic is thinking about models of neuroinflammation. And so as a general set of considerations for choice of models, um, I want to go through a few different uh, thoughts. One is the use of in vitro, that is cell culture, versus in vivo models. And um, I will just make a biased opinion here, and that is that neuroinflammation is a complex interaction of cell types in the brain. And so in vivo models, um, in rodents, for example, are probably uh, better representations of the complex phenomena that occur. 
However, in vitro models, such as uh, individual glial cell cultures or mixed cultures, for example, of microglia and neurons, can be used to proper effect to identify components of the neuroinflammatory cascade that may be involved in for example, neurotoxicity. And these have been used widely to um, test hypotheses about uh, different molecules that might be involved in the process. However, I would just state um, that testing these in vivo then becomes an important further characterization of these mechanisms and is an important fact because inflammation in the brain is a very complex phenomena and many different factors may be involved. Another consideration for model choice is the timing of the inflammation. Are you thinking about modeling acute processes, such as uh, the effects after trauma or ischemia, or a chronic long-term process, such as neurodegeneration found in Alzheimer's disease? The type of inflammatory stimulus is obviously an important factor. Um, a simple idea is that it depends on what you're trying to model. If it's infection, then you want to have um, a model that represents some aspect of infection. If it's injury or a degenerative process, then you need similar kinds of stimuli to model those. Another issue is the location of the stimulus for neuroinflammation. Um, as I'll demonstrate in some of the models I've selected to show you, uh, the brain can respond to peripheral stimuli, uh, such as bacterial infection. Uh, and this is important, depending on what you're trying to model. Or is it something within the brain tissue itself? And I'll show you examples of both in the slides to follow. And finally, in thinking about the models you're just looking at, one needs to think about what other endpoints you're planning on measuring. In animal models, behavior is often an outcome that people are interested in, particularly if you're talking about uh, recovery after an injury or um, a process that involves degeneration of certain neuron types. Electrophysiology recording, tissue analysis, there's a whole list of other endpoints one needs to be thinking about. And your model selection, um, may de the choice of model, may depend on what your outcomes are going to be. So for the first model I want to discuss uh, is one that's been used widely by many people uh, for many years. And this is the exposure of an animal to a peripheral injection of lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. Lipopolysaccharide is a component of gram-negative bacterial cell walls and is an potent inflammagen, that is, it elicits an inflammatory reaction by activating toll-like receptor 4. Now, the toll-like receptors are a set of molecules found on many cells in the body, but particular cells uh, such as macrophages and monocytes. And activation of these receptors leads to the rapid stimulation of a systemic inflammatory response. And these cells dump out peripheral cytokines and a number of other factors that are part of this response. Now, these cytokines and other factors that are released by the systemic inflammatory response to LPS have marked effects in the CNS. For example, the induction of fever, the induction of sickness behavior. These both we, can, we both can identify with when, in our own experiences with infections. Um, and finally, in you can get induction of microglial activation and a neuroinflammatory cascade. The mechanism of how LPS does these things is not fully understood. It may be that there could be transport of LPS or specific cytokines into the brain and have direct effects there through areas of the brain that are permeable, uh, that have a less developed blood-brain barrier. Another mechanism that's been studied is indirect activation of brain microglia by induction of prostaglandins. For example, in the systemic reaction following LPS, brain endothelial cells become activated and express new molecules. And these include the production of prostaglandins that may go then into the brain and elicit a further response within that tissue. And finally, there is some evidence that uh, there may actually be peripheral nerve stimulation uh, through the vagus nerve that leads to the brain reaction. So whereas the mechanism is not clear, peripheral LPS is a very uh, strong inducer of a systemic and 
brain inflammatory response. There are some other considerations to think about if you decide to use peripheral LPS as your model of neuroinflammation. First, the dose of LPS must be titrated to the desired effect, and so a wide range of doses can be used, ranging from modest, modest changes to death in the animal. It's really sort of a model of toxic shock is another way to think about it. Your source of LPS must be consistent from experiment to experiment. There are different LPS preparations from different gram-negative bacteria and obviously different manufacturers. And you may want to think about alternative approaches. So instead of uh, putting LPS into the animal, you might do injections of cytokines. For example, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1-beta, IL-6, or TNF-alpha have all been used successfully to model a peripheral inflammatory response that leads to neuroinflammation. In addition to LPS, you might use other pathogen-associated molecular pattern molecules, or PAMPs, such as bacterial flagellin, which activates the TLR5 receptor, poly-IC as a model of double-stranded RNA to activate the TLR3 receptor, or zymosin, a component of, 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 of yeast cell walls, which activates the TLR2 receptor. There are other kinds of um, ways to activate uh, the, the peripheral immune, the peripheral innate immunity to then elicit neuroinflammation, and one can use uh, so-called damage-associated molecular pattern molecules, such as DAMPs, that are released by cells upon damage uh, and signal to other cells to uh, elicit an innate inflammatory response. And one of these is the, is the protein HMGB1. Finally, some people would actually use peripheral infection, for example, with um, uh, E. coli bacteria to mimic the same kinds of effects you see with LPS. This might be a little more realistic model since that's the, um, that's the root ca cause of the presence of LPS. Now, although typically used for acute induction of inflammation, I'll show you some evidence that some of these inflammagens can have very long-lasting effects, so that needs to be considered as well. So I'll show you now some examples of the use of these agents in, uh, in, in models of neuroinflammation. So here's some studies that were recently published that demonstrate sickness behavior in mice two hours post-treatment. So if these animals were treated uh, with the various agents shown down here and then put in an activity chamber to measure their, their total activity. And as you can see, animals that were exposed to saline um, reached nearly baseline activity in this test. But just two hours after uh, introducing LPS into the body through an inter through an IP injection, LPS at this dose of 100 micrograms per kilogram led to a very dramatic reduction in basal uh, activity of the mice. And this is this is so, the so-called sickness behavior that happens in mice uh, with these peripheral inflammatory responses. And as you can see, interleukin-1 shown here in red at two different doses, and TNF-alpha shown in blue again at two different doses can have similar the less dramatic effects on baseline um, activity of the mice, suggesting that they too can elicit the sickness behavior. IL-6 shows it at a higher dose as shown here in this bar. In addition to these changes uh, that happen uh, in behavior of the mice, there is, as I mentioned already, a dramatic change in microglial morphology. And that's illustrated here uh, in a recent study by Kondo et al. So these are microglia shown here in control animals. And just two days after LPS administration, one can see a dramatic change in the morphology of these cells. And the morphology is a little better illustrated in this high power view below. You can see that the processes are now withdrawn and shortened in these animals. And what's important about this, uh, about this data is that they show that even 7 and 28 days after the LPS injection, it's just a single interper, um, interperitoneal injection of LPS, uh, 
there is a dramatic change in the morphology of the microglia consistent with a persistent uh, neuroinflammatory response. Now, in, in work uh, published originally by Quinn and reproduced by their lab and some others, um, I want to illustrate some of the um, long-term effects of, of um, peripheral LPS administration. So in this panel, what we're shown in different parts of the brain are, um, are microglia, again, in, in control tissue uh, from animals that did not receive LPS, and the substantia nigra, the hippocampus, and the cortex. And again, just three hours after LPS administration in these animals, and again, this is peripheral administration of LPS, we see this rapid change in the morphology of the microglia, signifying a neuroinflammatory response in all areas of the brain measured here, the substantia nigra, the hippocampus, and the cortex. Now, what's really interesting about these studies is that the um, investigators examined the mice for a long duration after this exposure. And what they discovered was that if they wait um, out here um, to seven or ten months after exposure and they look in a certain population of neurons, namely the dopaminergic neurons and the substantia nigra pars compacta, what they see, and it's illustrated in this panel, this is a control animal that received saline injection 10 months before this image was taken. And the, and the substantia nigra pars compacta shows its normal number of TH immunoreactive dopaminergic neurons. But in animals that were exposed to LPS, again, 10 months ago, there's a degeneration of these cells uh, in the substantia nigra, uh, accompanied by uh, at continued activation of the microglia that are seen. And so this has been uh, postulated to be a potential mechanism in uh, this model of Parkinson's disease, whereby peripheral inflammation can lead to a long-term uh, and long-lasting inflammatory response that eventually leads to loss of dopaminergic neurons in this critical part of the brain. So this leads us to uh, our second model of consideration, and that is the application of LPS or another inflammagen directly to the brain itself. So instead of uh, providing it peripherally and then waiting for a peripheral immune or innate immune response to then signal to the brain, one can directly inject uh, these compounds into the brain. And the reason this works is that microglia have TLR4 and other PAMP receptors, so direct CNS exposure to these inflammagens is an effective way to elicit neuroinflammation. And as you might assume, intracerebral ventricular injection or administration of these agents spreads widely through the brain wherever their CSF is present and provides widespread glial activation. In contrast, if the injection is limited to a specific part of the brain using intraparenchymal injection with stereotaxis, you can localize the neuroinflammation to very specific parts of the brain, for example, the hippocampus. One advantage of this approach of putting the inflammagen directly in the brain is that systemic effects uh, are less of a confound and that the mechanism is a little more straightforward. You put the inflammagen directly in the brain. You don't have to depend on the three or four different ways that the peripheral immune system might uh, interact with the CNS to create the neuroinflammation. So I've got a couple of examples of this work. This is work um, from Choi uh, in uh, 2008, where they used a model of direct intracerebral ventricular LPS um, in, in animals to elicit uh, neurodegeneration. And these illustrations are just 24 hours after uh, administration of LPS to the ventricles. And what's shown, I'll, I'll start actually with the right-hand panels. What they show, similar to what we saw previously in other tissues, is that LPS elicits a 
activation of microglia, detected here by staining for CD11B, which is a receptor present on microglia that's upregulated with inflammation, CD45, which is expressed on microglia, and actually infil infiltrating peripheral cells. Uh, the FC receptor um, goes up and some other proteins go up as well. So what we're seeing here is just 24 hours after ICV LPS in these animals, we're seeing a robust increase in microglial activation. And these authors also reported in specific regions of the hippocampus shown here and enlarged here, uh, degeneration of specific neuron types. And this is detected here in this panel uh, with fluorojade staining. Again, these are control animals that received a vehicle injection. These are animals that received LPS 24 hours earlier. And you can see the pickup of the stain fluorojade indicating degenerating cells. And a crestal violet stain shows some evidence here in this area, uh, better illustrated here, of um, loss of cells in what appears to me to be the uh, hyalur part of the, um, of the hippocampus. Another example of um, using LPS directly uh, is shown in this work uh, published by Hopan et al. Uh, that reproduces work uh, published uh, previously by a number of authors where LPS is directly injected into the substantia nigra. And in this example, I believe we're looking um, 20 days after the injection of LPS. So similar to the peripheral inflammatory reaction we looked at before where dopaminergic cells were lost, uh, adding LPS directly to the substantia nigra can do the same thing. So that's best illustrated here uh, in this panel on the left-hand side by um, uh, illustrations of the level of the, of the uh, brainstem, where vehicle injection, if you look at the uninjected versus the injected side for tyrosine hydroxylase positive cells, you don't see much difference. But when LPS is injected, you see a dramatic loss in the staining, as illustrated here. And this depletion of tyrosine hydroxylase positive cells in the pars, uh, uh, pars compacta of the um, of the substantia nigra leads to a loss of their fiber input into the striatum. And so if you look at the striatum in these animals, vehicle injected, the TH staining in the striatum looks about the same, but in the LPS injected animals, you can see a dramatic reduction in striatal dopamine, um, striatal tyrosine hydroxylase um, e expression. And this was accompanied in this particular study by behavioral deficits in these animals that could be elicited with amphetamines. This is used now as a model of dopaminergic neuron loss in Parkinson's disease and uh, is widely, uh, this kind of evidence is widely used to um, associate inflammatory reactions with that disease process. Now, one important consideration when you're using intraparenchymal or ICV administration of agents is to keep in mind that inserting anything into the brain, a cannula or a needle itself, can lead to a neuroinflammatory reaction. And show, so I show here some data from a, an older paper um, published in my own lab by a talented graduate student at the time, Stephanos Kirkinides, that shows stab wound with a needle in rats uh, that were young or old, and it shows staining in this case for, I believe this is GFAP or gliofibrillary acidic protein, the marker for activated astrocytes. And so in young animals, uh, when a stab happens, and this is now 72 hours after the stab, one can detect increased expression of glial fibrillary acidic protein in the area adjacent to the stab wound that's marked here by S. And this is, represents a local neuroinflammatory reaction to the stab itself. Importantly, if you do the same experiment in very old rats, uh, I believe these rats were 30 months of age at the time of the experiment, um, in a sham, um, in uh, a sham control, you don't see much staining for GFAP, maybe a little more than the young. But when you look at the animal in the field adjacent to the stab wound, there's a much larger, much greater uh, response of GFAP reimmunoreactivity or neuroinflammation 
uh, to the stab wound. So this brings up a couple of important points. One is the stab injury itself needs to be controlled for in any experiment where you administer inflammagens directly to the brain. It also brings up the point that the inflammatory reaction may differ depending on other factors, in this case, the age of the animal. And that's something very important to keep in mind as you think about your own experiments. So to summarize some of this uh, information about proper controls and, and thinking about experiments where you're administering um, substances to the brain, it's critical to keep in mind that the injection alone is sufficient to cause neuroinflammation and must be taken into account. In thinking about this, the minimum control needed when you're doing animal experiments with injections would be to do injections and either in another part of the brain or in a different animal with the vehicle used to administer your inflammagen. In many cases, uh, it's advisable to also include a sham injected control to determine the effect of vehicle injection alone. This sometimes will come up when reviewers read your papers, so doing it before you actually um, send the information out for publication is a useful, um, useful bit, tidbit to keep in mind. Another issue is that one can reduce the impact of injections on eliciting neuroinflammation so that you're focused more on the inflammation that you put into the brain. And this can be accomplished with several different approaches. One can use very small needles. Uh, in our hands, we use a 33-gauge needle uh, in our stereotactic apparatus. One should use a, the minimum volume, volume possible for these injections. Larger volumes of solutes can create greater uh, damage to local tissue and consequential neuroinflammation. It's critical to in, uh, do the injection slowly so that the substance is allowed to diffuse slowly into the brain. This requires a setup with a microprocessor controlled injector. And another uh, way to avoid the um, confound that uh, injecting something into the brain can create is just to delay your examination of the endpoint. Injections to, um, to stab wounds alone or to, to needles alone will largely subside over a period of time. And I illustrate that in the following uh, pictures that come from uh, a colleague of mine at Rochester, John Olshavka. In these studies, all that was done was that saline was injected into the mouse striatum and tissue was examined on day one and day five. And as can be seen in these illustrations, staining for different elements such as MCP1, which stains activated astrocytes, MAC2, which stains activated microglia, and, P and a stain um, for polymorphonuclear leukocytes or neutrophils that infiltrate the brain following stab show one day after stab, uh, after the injection with saline, that you get a very robust local neuroinflammatory reaction. However, if one waits to day five after that injection, you can see that most of this reaction has largely subsided. So in thinking about experiments and your time points, one way to reduce the impact of inflammation itself due to the stab wound is to wait uh, uh, for a later endpoint. So we talked about some fairly simple ways to create uh, inflammation in the brain. Uh, the first was a peripheral LPS injection or, L or, or, or exposure of animals to other inflammagens for, via peripheral routes. The second was to um, put the substance directly into the brain through interparenchymal or ICV injection. But other models have been used and are now more widely used than they were perhaps before. And this includes the development of specific transgenic mice that are, can be engineered to transgenically overexpress or express pro-inflammatory cytokines or other inflammagens. Uh, a good example of that is mice that express the HIV TAT protein, which has a neuroinflammatory um, response when it's uh, present in brain. And these, these mice provide a means to explore more chronic expression or production of these inflammagens. And the choice of promoter uh, for the transgenic mice can provide some uh, temporal and or spatial control of expression. 
Um, but in general, if you if you set up an animal to overexpress something like a cytokine uh, using uh, standard promoters such as GFAP or neural promoters, uh, what you'll have is a very broad type of reaction in the brain uh, that can lead to um, some unexpected findings such as major behavioral changes such as seizures and this sort of thing. Um, so there are also modified transgenic approaches that can provide significant improvement in the temporal and spatial control of cytokine expression. And one model that I'll share with you that we've used extensively in our laboratory is called the Excisional Activation of Transcription Model, or EXAT model. Uh, and as I already mentioned, the effects of chronically expressing cytokines or other inflammations in the brain can be quite profound. So to start off, I'll just show you one example of a mouse that was created by Ian Campbell some time ago where IL-6 is transgenically expressed under the direction of the mouse GFAP promoter. And in these animals, um, if you look in cerebellum, I believe these slides are at three months of age, and look at GFAP expression uh, in cerebellum, one can detect, as shown here, relative to the wild-type expression of GFAP in the animals where IL-6 is expressed from the GFAP promoter, there's a very dramatic uh, induction of astrocyte activation. And using a lectin stain, as shown in these lower panels, uh, Dr. Campbell and associates were able to show an increased uh, microglial uh, immunoreactivity um, in these tissues as well. In their model, a uh, long-term expression of IL-6 is accompanied by neural degeneration, particularly in the cerebellum. And this is illustrated here in the panels labeled B. Wild-type animals have a fairly clear, uh, distinct granular and molecular cell layer in the cerebellum. And this is greatly modified with degeneration of the granule cells and, um, and changes uh, within the cerebellum of mice overexpressing IL-6. As promised, I said I would talk about uh, a different model where um, we can have greater control over the temporal and spatial expression of inflammation. And I'd like you to, to introduce you now to the IL-1 beta EXAT model, which was a model developed uh, in my laboratory with a talented MD-PhD student, Saul Shaftel, and my colleague, Stephanos Kirkinides. And this model incorporates a specific, trans, a specific transgene shown illustrated here um, that is expressed in mice, that's transgenically maintained in mice, that has a murine GFAP promoter. It has human interleukin-1 beta, and we use human because it reacts with the mouse, um, the mouse IL-1 receptor, but um, can be immunologically distinguished from the mouse. Um, and this has been modified uh, with a signal sequence on the front of it so that it's uh, uh, directly secreted into the brain rather than having to go through a caspase-dependent um, um, caspase step before activation. And the GFEP promoter and the IL-1 cDNA are separated by a transcriptional stop element shown here in purple, which is flanked by these LOXP elements. And what this allows us to do in this model is to add Cree recombinase using a viral vector. This causes a recombination event, and now the GFAP promoter is directly upstream of IL-1 beta, and you get expression of IL-1 beta and a subsequent uh, inflammatory response. And that's illustrated here, where we have um, placed FIV Cree as our viral vector, a lentivirus expressing Cree recombinase, into the hippocampus of these transgenic mice. And just two weeks later, when we use an MHC2 stain to look at activated microglia, we see robust induction in the in the ipsilateral um, hippocampus. That is the hippocampus that receives a viral injection. Um, and this does not happen in non-transgenic animals. And this is accompanied by uh, clear evidence of neuroinflammation. This is illustrated here by IBA1 staining for microglia. In an animal that does not contain the transgene, the, induct the presence of the Cree recombinase does not change the morphology of the uh, microglial cells, nor does it induce MHC2. 
However, when the transgene is present and we add virus, we get a very robust expression of uh, the microglial markers for IBA1 and MAC2. And you can also see here, uh, by looking at glial fibrillary acidic protein, a marked astrogliosis in the dentate gyrus of these mice. Now, we've published widely on these papers, and uh, you can uh, Google me if you want to find some additional papers uh, using this model, but just one example um, of the potential benefits of inflammation, I illustrated a paper recently published by a graduate student in my lab, Semi Ghosh, and what was done here is that this model, this XSAT model, was used um, to cross with a model of um, of amyloid deposition in a mouse that expresses the AP the amyloid precursor protein, a presenilin-1 gene, and tau. This triple transgenic mouse develops plaques in its brain at about 12 months of age in our hands. And what Simi did was to put interleukin, this, to cross the XSAT model with this mouse and then activate inflammation, or IL-1-directed inflammation, in the brain using a viral Cre injection. And what you can see is the plaque load between the uninjected and the injected side of one of these mice, uh, a wild-type mouse that lacks the IL-1 transgene, is essentially the same between the two sides. But in the, tri in the triple transgenic mice that has the uh, IL-1 transgene, you can see that we actually have clearance of the plaque in the presence of IL-1 overexpression. And this was actually a very surprising finding for us and has driven a lot of our interest in thinking about how neuroinflammation may be actually protective, at, such, at least in terms of amyloid pathology in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease. But it's not all, uh, all one way. Uh, in the same animals, uh, and they looked at the tau phosphorylation as a marker of neurofibrillary tangle progression in these animals. And as illustrated here, if you look, and the panel set up a little differently, if you look at staining for P205, one of several epitopes um, uh, associated with Alzheimer's pathology, again, in looking at the two sides, the injected and the uninjected side, in animals that lack the transgene, you see some degree of staining for this. But in animals that have the transgene, on the side that inflammation happens, you actually get more expression of this tau phosphorylated epitope. And that's illustrated perhaps better here in Western blots from these animals. We're looking at three epitopes, uh, P2, PT205, AT180, and PHF1 are all greatly um, increased over the control uh, non-injected sides of these animals suggesting that when we overexpress interleukin-1 beta, as I illustrated in the previous slide, that one can reduce plaque deposition, but a negative effect is to enhance tau phosphorylation. And so this is, again, um, important in thinking about uh, the role of inflammation in both positive and negative aspects um, of brain pathology. These animals we've used in other kinds of studies, uh, and not to belabor this point, one can look at these references, but um, inducing interleukin-1 beta uh, in the, in bilaterally in the hippocampus can lead to behavioral deficits, and I just uh, point out this illustration here in D using contextual uh, fear conditioning that animals that are injected with a virus uh, that has the Cree recombinase and therefore express IL-1 show a loss of, um, of function in this uh, contextual fear conditioning test, one behavioral test of uh, hippocampal dependent activity. And finally, in one additional illustration from these animals, uh, Mike Wu, a graduate student in my lab, showed that um, overexpression of interleukin-1 uh, in the hippocampus leads to robust decrease in neurogenesis, as shown here, um, one month following uh, induction of inflammation by staining with the marker double cortin, shown here on the contralateral side, which uh, is ex a molecule expressed by neuroblasts as they migrate and differentiate into the granule cells of the hippocampus. <laughs> 
So the final model that I'd like to describe for you today is um, a, a, a use of viral vectors to directly transduce cytokines or other inflammagens into the CNS. And these have the advantage of the EXAT model that I mentioned already, which provides spatial and temporal control of expression. You can wait until the animal is an adult, for example, before you, uh, before you do your experiment. And they also have the potential of providing persistent expression of the cytokine or inflammagen. Now, in thinking about viral vectors for the, in neuroinflammatory models, one has to think carefully about what vectors to use. Um, the one that's most commonly used in the literature now is adeno-associated virus, or AAV. And different serotypes are available of AAV that can provide some degree of transduction selectivity. For example, AAV2 tends to uh, transduce neurons in the brain, whereas AAV5 has some preference for astrocytes. Uh, lentiviral vectors based on several different backbones are also commonly used for transduction of uh, cytokines and other uh, inflammagens into the brain. And other vectors, such as adenovirus or herpes virus, are typically not used anymore. Uh, one reason is these viral vectors show greater immunogenicity uh, and react with the brain to create their own neuroinflammatory response. So lentiviral or AAV vectors are, are, better, are more preferred in these cases. And a typical control in these kinds of experiments is a vi the same viral vector, but expressing a green fluorescent protein or some other irrelevant protein uh, in the brain as a, as a negative control. Uh, this allows you to have the injection control we talked about before. Uh, one might also want to have sham controls as well, just to um, test whether the virus itself has any effect. So as a first example of the use of viral vectors to induce neuroinflammation, I show work from Dr. Chakrabarty, uh, who works with Todd Gold. Um, and this work uh, shows the use of an AAV2 vector overexpressing TNF-alpha, a potent pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these are illustrations taken six weeks after transduction with the viral vector. And as you can see in panels A and B, looking at GFAP staining for activated astrocytes, the presence of TNF expression for six weeks has a marked increase in astrogliosis, illustrated here, and in panel D under high power. And then if we look at using IBA1 to mark microglia, we can see that TNF has a fairly localized but also um, traumatic uh, increase in microglial uh, expression of IBA1. And you can see here under high power the telltale signs of the activated phenotype that I've been describing all throughout this talk. In our own hands, we've developed AAV vectors to overexpress interleukin-1 beta. And I'm showing results here taken four weeks after injection. As one can see, this is again using IBA1 to stain microglia in this immunofluorescent image. Um, and one can see uh, staining for IBA1 that's present in hippocampus, but it's dramatically altered when one overexpresses IL-1 beta for four weeks. And numbers of the uh, area occupied by the IBA1 uh, staining are shown here in terms of percent fraction area. But we also measured things like murine interleukin-1 beta and the chemokine CCL2 in these inflamed tissues as other markers of inflammation to think about. These same animals were used to look at, uh, uh, at um, the ability of the inflamed brain to recruit cells from the periphery. And this was done using bone marrow chimeras, in this case with bone marrow uh, derived uh, from, from animals that express GFAP um, uh, continuously through an actin promoter. And what one can see in a bone marrow chimeric animal that expresses GFP in its bone marrow, that in IL-1, in the presence of IL-1 transduction, there's a robust infiltration of these green cells into the hippocampus, as illustrated here, uh, with uh, GFP and hoax stain to label cell nuclei. 
here with GFAP, GFP, excuse me, and IBA1 to illustrate microglia, and then here in the combined image. Importantly, and if you do this in animals that lack the CCR2 receptor on the bone marrow, uh, very few of these cells enter the brain. So um, I've introduced you to uh, four potential ways of eliciting neuroinflammation in the brain. And just to summarize those, there's the use of peripheral LPS or other inflammagens to elicit a systemic response that then has effects on the brain. Uh, second was to actually put LPS or, again, another inflammagen directly into the brain, either into the ventricle of the brain to, um, or into the parenchyma, both ways uh, getting around the blood-brain barrier and uh, directly exposing the brain to these inflammagens. Um, the third model I showed was the development of transgenic models that could overexpress cytokines, either uh, from promoters that were active throughout the entire animal or in a special model, the EXAT model, in a way that allows some selectivity of the timing and the uh, lo localization of inflammation. And finally, in models that a number of uh, my colleagues are now using, where viral vectors are developed that actually can transduce cytokines or other inflammagens directly into the brain uh, at a choice uh, and a timing of one's uh, preference. Um, all of these uh, uh, models uh, have caveats that I hope I've shared with you. Uh, but I also want to mention that there are other models of neuroinflammation one that I haven't dwelled on at all is experimental allergic encephalomyelitis, or EAE. And this is widely used as a model of multiple sclerosis and depends on injecting mice uh, or rats with an antigen that mimics myelin uh, and leads to a T-cell-directed autoimmunity. And this model is widely used to investigate the interplay of the peripheral immune system with the central nervous system. And although neuroinflammation occurs in this model, and people do study it in this context, because of the large peripheral set of an, uh, the large influence of the periphery on this thing, it's a very, a very different kind of model than the ones I've described already and would require a full seminar to discuss. There are other ways of thinking about how to get neuroinflammation. And so um, other possibilities are that peripheral inflammatory disorders themselves can give rise to neuroinflammation. So one has to think about this in the context of the disease or the disease processes that one is considering. So for example, uh, upper respiratory infection, arthritis, atherosclerosis, or even metabolic syndrome which are all peripheral, uh, peripheral changes um, in, in the body that create a systemic uh, innate in inflammatory response can influence the brain. And as one example, I'll show you in my final data slide some work from my colleague Stephanos Kirkinides where a mouse model was developed that was an inducible model of arthritis Specifically, arthritis was induced by overexpression of the cytokine interleukin-1 beta in joints. And in this animal, um, here, um, I think this is four months after induction of arthritis in the joints, one saw in the brain, particularly in the brain stem, a dramatic increase of both glial fibrillary acidic protein or astrocyte staining in the brain versus control animals or uh, MHC2, which indicates microglial activation in the brain stem of these animals as well. And that, it, that data is quantified in this slide below. And that includes the cell staining as well as expression of uh, RNA for different uh, markers of this process. So in this model, arthritis is happening in the periphery, but the brain is responding to that change. And it leads to thinking about other kinds of models of neuroinflammation and how this is an important feature of peripheral disease responses. Something to keep in mind as you think about what you're trying to model. So to sum up, um, I think I can say it quite simply. Um, I've 
share with you a number of different models of neuroinflammation and hope that these give you some uh, ideas that you can pursue in your own labs. But ultimately, there are as many ways to cause neuroinflammation as there are ways to injure the brain. And this is because neuroinflammation is such a stereotypical response to injury that although there are nuances between the different models in terms of chronicity and specific cell types involved, um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, general phenomena and one that I think uh, that my own bias is very important uh, in thinking about brain disease and even peripheral disease. So I thank you for your time and hope that this has been informative. All right, thank you, Dr. O'Banion. So let's go ahead and proceed to the question and answer segment. So if you haven't yet submitted a question, now is the time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Also, we have a special offer for attendees uh, at the end of this webinar today, so please stay with us to get the details. So let's go ahead and see what questions have come in so far. All right, first question is, how reproducible are the in vitro models of neuroinflammation with astrocytes and microglia co-cultured? Are these routinely used as a screening tool? Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, I think that the issues related to using primary cultures of microglia and astrocytes are the same uh, associated with any setup of primary cultures. Uh, one has to be very reproducible in creating those cultures um, and, and consistent in that. And my own experience in the lab is that from time to time this doesn't always work out. Um, some people circumvent this by using using um, cultures that um, are derived from uh, you know, um, cell lines, uh, BV2 microglia, for example, and this can um, help with uh, specific screening uh, uh, applic applications. However, um, I would just warn that many of the responses that happen in, in these in vitro cell lines are, are different, and so one needs then that happens in the primary cultures, and so one needs to confirm and validate that the responses you're looking at are what you're interested in. Um, but yes, these can be used for screening, and I believe have been used for screening for compounds, for example, that have anti-inflammatory properties. Okay, next question, um, asking, I'd like to know how the LPS or poly-IC induced inflammatory models are differentiated, meaning the bacterial, which is the LPS, and the viral infection, which is the poly-IC, um, says these chemicals are widely used in studying both the inflammation and disease changes, so at what point, like a different dose, exposure time, or secretory molecules, um, are these models differentiated? Hmm. So um, I have to confess I've not used the uh, poly-IC model myself, so I don't have a lot of expertise to be able to speak directly to the, the major differences between those. Um, I, um, I actually think that's a great question and one that I would have to look in the literature um, to better understand. Um, both are acting through toll-like receptors, but they are acting on different receptors. Um, and I guess the, the big question is, ultimately, if you're doing this um, chron you know, by, by peripheral injection, are you eliciting the same kind of systemic inflammatory response in the periphery? And my guess is that the response would be similar but not identical, and therefore you may see some differences in brain. But frankly, I don't know the, the answer to the question. All right, the next question then. Uh, what is the best inflammation model that can be used in the case of ischemic stroke? Well, um, I think ischemic stroke itself creates its own uh, inflammatory response. As I was mentioning in my last slide, any injury to the brain creates, um, creates neuroinflammation. And so most individuals studying um, ischemic stroke would um, use um, uh, reagents or uh, genetic manipulation to 
differences in LPS-induced sickness behavior between individuals even though they were administered the same dose of LPS? Uh, how can we overcome this issue? <laughs> the, well, the, to, I guess you'd have to dose more in, and more individuals. I think that's a big problem uh, working in vivo with many of these models is that there is some inconsistency um, from mouse to mouse. Um, I think um, one has to just um, be very careful to to be consistent about the administration. Excuse me, I need to cough here. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, one needs to be consistent, um, but you're right that you are going to see variability from animal to animal, and um, I'm not I'm not really sure how to overcome that most easily. Yeah, obviously a tough problem. All right, next question says: Is there a specific serum marker of neuroinflammation that could be assayed in living animals? <clears throat> um, there are some markers. Um, Typically, people look at acute reactant phase proteins. Um, one that is used a lot is IL-6. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, another question says, what models would be a best fit for neuropathy or chronic pain? Hmm. Um, those are good questions. Um, Again, most of those models depend on um, nerve injury. Um, excuse me, I'm starting to lose my voice here. Are, are dependent on nerve injury or some other um, kind of tra trauma um, or some toxicity to um, create neuropathy. I'm not sure of specific neuroinflammatory models that would be used to generate such endpoints. Okay, we're actually just about out of time, and uh, so we will, the, the questions that have come in are great, although we're out of time, um, so we will get back to those of you who have uh, submitted questions after the webinar. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a special offer for today's webinar attendee. Uh, you can get 20% off of any Wiley Neuroscience books using the discount code NEU14. Um, at Wiley.com, and this includes the recently published Neuroinflammation and CNS Disorders book edited by Nicola Woodruff and Sandra Amor, and this offer is good through 2014. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. So on behalf of our speaker, Dr. Carrie O'Banion, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, R&D Systems, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar and hope you learned some valuable information. This concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols.